Welcome, everyone. This is um, panel Dash Shaw and Eleanor Davis in conversation. Uh, my name is Rob Clow, and I'll be moderating this panel, which should mostly just be a conversation. So I'm just adding a question or two. Um, I'm delighted to do this particular panel because I consider Dash and Eleanor both to be two of the best cartoonists in the world. Um, and their work has been constantly innovative and searching. And um, I think I'll actually kind of start on this, this kind of idea because one of the things I like best about their work is that it's, they never do the same thing twice. And every book, they've done a lot of genre work. Um, and have just been in, in all, all kinds of different fields and places. And I'm gonna kind of uh, show some imagery of some of their work. It's roughly chronological, but I kind of want to start in this idea. And you guys, you know, once you guys get going, basically I'm, I'll talk again when we run out of things to say. Um, but I want to kind of get in this idea of, as, as artists, as cartoonists, what has led the seemingly constant desire to always try something new? And Eleanor, why don't you start? Oh, um, oh boy, I should have thought harder about this. Um, there's a bunch of different reasons. One is that no, no style fits every thing that I want to, to do. So each new idea, like my, I feel like my entire style and approach has to be changed and adjusted to, to address the, the thing that I'm trying to say. I also get really, really bored. Um, and I usually am agonizingly bored by about page 12 of whatever comic I'm drawing, <laughs> which is really rough if you're doing anything that's over 12 pages, which is why I usually don't. Um, um, the, other, the other thing is that I have this theory that I don't think has stood me very well, but that I'm always trying to draw the thing. I never want to accidentally start drawing the drawing of the thing. And if I repeat myself often enough, I start drawing the drawing. Uh, and then it dies. I don't know how much it dies on the page, but it, it dies in my heart. And uh, so that I have to change it up. There is a, of um, what you just said, it reminds, they asked Seiichi Hayashi this in some interview I read. And he said that when you start trying to draw in a way, you're an amateur, and then it gets hammered out. And so he changed how he drew to stay at the amateur level. Um, like you become a very good amateur. Uh, and that, I think, what he said was a version of what you just said. Because you can see, oh, that stopped being an ear. Now that's just these lines that that person makes. Yep. Or, um, oh, that looks kind of like, that doesn't look like a muscle anymore. Now it looks like kind of these weird marks that someone makes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I also, I, have, I kind of have a different way of saying, I think also exactly the same thing that you said, which is um, uh, the story comes first, and then I wonder how do you draw the story? Whereas I think a lot of artists, they draw, and the story comes out of the doodling. Um, and so many amazing comics have been done that way. But I think now that I've been doing it for a long time, I'm like, oh, I'm, why aren't I like that? It's like, well, I have a story idea, and then I think, I can't use this pen anymore for this particular story. I have to change the pen, because it looks weird if I draw this story with this pen. Um, so there's that. I also think, maybe not um, the, the coolest thing to admit, but I feel like it's part of it, is uh, hatred of past work. Mm -hmm. And um, that that must be some part of it. 
and being like, no way, I can't. <laughs> I can't do another book with that pen. <laughs> and it's often just changing the tools because um, I'm certainly not a great uh, chameleon of, of mm -hmm. like drawing in different ways. It's usually just changing the tool. Okay, changing the scale. Mm -hmm. Draw, go from a thick pen to a thin pen. Drawing on 18 by 24 to eight and a half by 11. And why would this story ask for eight and a half by 11 instead of 18 by 24? Some <laughs> psychotic reason you know, <laughs> that like only makes sense after having a r thought about it in some weird wormhole way. Um, so that's, that's technique, but all of you have been big genre jumpers. And while you started in children's comics, um, and your work has ranged from everything from autobio to like strange gag work and why art to the BDSM issue of Frontier. And then Dash, you did a, an adaptation of Clue, which was literally the last thing I expected you to do, and yet it really worked. Um, do you feel a restlessness, not just with art, but with story as well? And you can start, Dash. Uh, for, um, for me, I, I think there has to be two things. It has to seem like something that only I would do. Um, and I think that's pretty easy. I think most people would say that that's like, that's kind of what you tell a kid to do. Like do something, tell a story only you would tell. And, but then this part two, part of it has to be is why would anyone do that? Um, and it has to follow both, of, it, has to, it has to answer both of those. So, um, because if there's some reason why, then it feels kind of solved. So, especially comics, they take a long time to make. So, um, you know, like that Clue one, why would there be a Clue comic? Who's buying it? You know, who, who asked for it? Why? Like, what, what's the purpose? So even though it was a commercial comic, I, it still kind of, it still worked for me. It checked the box of why would this exist. Um, so, um, yeah, do you have a um, different genre? Uh, I think that when I do kids stuff, it's because I want to make money. Uh, that hasn't, <laughs> hasn't worked super well, but that's been the hope. Um, and I started out doing maybe a little bit more magical realism. I think that it's always, the, the hope is always, it's the pursuit of truth. And to try to write something true um, that can communicate what you're feeling, what I'm feeling with maximum efficacy to the reader. And when I was younger, it felt like fantasy was the best way to do that. Uh, something fantastical, like a fantastical metaphor, monsters. Um, and now that stuff has stopped ringing as true to me. <clears throat> and I don't know if that's because I've gotten older or just because uh, times change. Mm. But I've, so I've kind of been winnowing out the, uh, the conceits, but then that makes it harder to write and have something be fun um, without, you know, the kind of like silly tricks and the, the, the sort of in-your-face metaphors, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I assume no one in comics gets paid well, so I never would have thought the motivation was money for the kids' book. But the, I know you said that probably half jokingly, but uh, I don't. I, I really don't get paid well for the adult stuff. Um, That's the, the difference. Uh, <laughs> the, I I've never done something for Tune Books, but it, what seemed appealing about it to me was working with Francois Mouly, who because yeah, you've done all of those with. Her. She's the editor, yeah, and right? Yeah, she's amazing. She's a. It's like. Um, for those who don't, she co-edited. She 
she co-created Raw with Art Spiegelman, and uh, I've never done, so I always, I thought, can you tell us something about what it's like uh, working with her? Is, is Francoise in the audience? She's not here. Okay, good. Well, I have a huge, <laughs> I, have a, I have a huge crush on her, which makes it very intense to work with her. She's kind of like, if anybody's seen the Bergman um, magic flute, she kind of reminds me of the queen of the night in it. I, I don't know if that resonates with anybody. She's very like intense um, and powerful. In a very, and, very French way. Yes, very cool. Uh, yeah, I guess as far as a working relationship, I prefer to be the most powerful person <laughs> and not have to work with somebody who's more powerful than me. But it was, you know, exciting. Is there some little, I don't know, is there something you can say that she said that stuck with you? I'm, I, I want to know. Oh, man. Uh, oh, God. This is a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> it's like absolutely the worst question to have to answer in front of a bunch of people. I remember driving with her in Manhattan she was a very aggressive driver, and she said, oh. uh, I was like, oh, it must be so hard to drive in Manhattan. She was like, oh, no, it's not hard at all. You just, all you have to, the, and imagine a beautiful French accent. Uh, my job is what's in front of me. What's behind me is not my problem. <laughs> Perfect. And I think about that all it. the time. <laughs> I love it. Um, so I'm going to take everyone on like a little brief tour of kind of your careers, um, and which will be especially enjoyable since you know knowing how much you hate your old work. And this is the the first major thing I saw from Dash called Garden Head, which was like oh 22 years ago, um, and I was struck by like the depth of innovation in it. Uh, you could see. And in both of your work, I see a lot of like thinking about what you're doing. It's the cover of another early one from Dash, The Mother's Mouth. And then here's some of Eleanor's early work. Uh, mm. This is The Beast Mother. And this is from a mini called uh, Maddie and Dodie. And what's remarkable is that for both of you, um, while you've evolved in terms of what you do, you kind of came out as cartoonists you only fully formed. Um, how do you feel about your evolution over the years? <laughs> you go for it. Uh, oh, boy. I mean, there were a lot of comics before this that were even worse. This is a, these were great comics. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's just like that wasn't... I didn't draw like that straight out the gate. I was, sure. I, I did. I did this like. Is still fairly early in your Yes. Uh, what was the question again? Um, Just, basically, that both of you, um, maybe not at the very beginning, but it didn't take long for both of you to find a mature style that you've kind of maintained since, but you've just evolved in other ways. God, it felt like of, it took forever. Yeah, I feel like maybe that's your perspective. Possibly. <laughs> so. I feel like, oh man, only the only, maybe only the last one is maybe okay. <laughs> but thank you. You're very nice. I'm not, but I like your work. And <laughs> I've literally been reviewing their work since they were both like 19 years old. So I've, I'm, I've seen the evolution. I can see that's why I'm fascinated by this. And it is unsurprising that this is both of your reactions to this. <laughs> this was Dash's big breakthrough, bottomless belly button. Um, and uh, the subsequent one, because simultaneously he was doing Body World as a webcomic, and it may be the best webcomic I've ever seen in terms of using the form in a really interesting way. Um, and here's a page with good old Polly Panther, um, one of Dash's many miscreant characters. Here's a, this is Eleanor's first book with Toon Book. This is Stinky, which won a whole, a giant pile of awards. Um, and this is my, personally perhaps my favorite kids book ever, Secret Science oh, Alliance. Thank you. And it is my kids' favorite book. Oh. 
Um, and look at these pages. It is, it's banana cakes, what you were doing in this book. Um, uh, Drew actually inked this. I know. Okay, sorry. Just to get, give him credit where credit is due. Yeah. That's my husband. And, and you and Drew also did a book together, which is also brilliant. Thank with you. Them. And then here we have Dash. This is a story in Moan called um, Satellite CMYK, in which every color indicated a different level in this satellite space station and how they all were like melding together. Um, and this is where I want to kind of lead into. Uh, this is when Dash is starting to experiment with color in a really innovative way. Um, both of you are unusual for cartoonists who work in color in that for many cartoonists, color is it's a thing to balance your page. It's a thing to add weight. It's a thing to get rid of negative space. But both of you are frequently very aggressive and innovative in the way you use color. And I'd like to hear about what led you in this direction. Um, how do you think about color? Because again, the th one of the things I see that you have, you have in common is that you're both very, very intentional about everything you're doing. And Eleanor, why don't you start this one? Well, can Dash start? With Dash, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I also, I don't know if you said, Eleanor and I are the same age. And I feel like uh, in the 90s, comics were mostly black and white, alternative comics. And then uh, I felt like there were two, there were, from, from my eyes, there were kind of two schools of color where it was sort of like the Chris Ware Tintin school, which is basically like naturalistic color. The, and, uh, and then there was like rubber blanket, um, silk screen color, two, two colors combining to make a third color, silk screen comics. Um, so uh, because of, uh, it just felt like color was an open area to me, to my, probably to you too, where it felt like, could color add meaning to a story? Because especially with line art uh, trappings, like if you draw a tree, you can tell it's a tree from the line art. So it doesn't necessarily have to have brown and green. It can be purple, it can be anything. Um, so when it started for me, it was like, how can color be meaningful? And that was kind of like this, where it was kind of like quite literal color coding things happening. And then that kind of turned into um, less literal color, expressionistic color, where basically I thought that the color was like the film, film score in a movie where you know the content of a scene from the visuals. So then there's this other element that's abstract. And especially like a very, um, in, in a very in your face score, like a Bernard Herrmann score, you know, it's not subtle. It's like there's a person in the shower and then there's like ring, 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 and you know it's there and it's huge. And so, uh, and it, the, it, it's a collision between these two things that equal the, the scene. So when I was, so then after this, for things like, um, I did something called My Entire High School Singing to the Sea as a comic, and then New School was drawn this way. I was thinking of the, the color being the score and how it aligns with the content would equal some third thing. Um, and it was really exciting. I was like, you know, for me and... Um, you, yeah. um, I, get, I don't think that... I don't have as much of a sophisticated answer, I don't think, but I've always been really attracted to artists that uh, feel really brave, um, brave enough to do stuff that looks really ugly or like intense. I really like intense colors, intense drawings. Um, so often I was, I try to, I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to do, uh, something that's really stylized. I want a really like the brightest reds and the, um, and then looking back on it, I'm like, why did I, dude, that looks crazy. <laughs> Why did I make those crazy color choices? 
Um, and then the other thing is that I have a constant battle with line and color. I love when other people just do like the Chris Ware Tintin line work with, and then it's colored in, I think it looks great. And I love it. And then when I do that, I hate it. And it makes it feel like my lines are drowning. Drowning. And I end up wanting to get rid of the lines completely, um, which is why if you go to the previous one, why I end up with this weird kind of. Were lines there and then you'd cut them out? Like when you drew it, their lines were there. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and then, but, but it's kind of a problem because I, I mean, looking back on it, I'm like, actually, the line is what I'm best at, and so I was actively getting rid of the thing that I was best at in favor of shape and and color, which I'm not as skillful at. I don't. I'm still trying to figure that one out. It's it makes me pretty nuts. Um, yeah, and then now. One of the main things that seems really important to me about color is that I've never been able to satisfyingly show. Comics are so inherently flattening. They're cartoony, which is something that I love, but when it sometimes it can kind of end up being dehumanizing in a way that's really shitty. And the fact that I, I, I'm not a talented enough artist to be able to show a variety of skin tone in black and white um, as much as I've tried. And, and then, so I, color is like the only solution there for me. Uh, other artists can do it, I, I haven't been able to. Um, and so then I'm back in the problem of the line and the color of biting each other, and I, I'll, I'll never be able to solve that one, I suspect. Until I'm 80 years old, I'll be on my deathbed, I'll be 99, I'll be like, ah, now I finally understand <laughs> the line-color combo. Um, I kind of like that both of you, uh, I'm very thankful that prior to this panel, both of you like kind of studied up on each other's work a little bit. Um, and at this point, I'd kind of like to ask Dash, um, having done that, what are some of, th some of your reactions to Eleanor's work? You don't have to answer this, things Dash. That you wanna, <laughs> Pass. Things you want to dig into, comment about. Pass. Yeah, let's, let's no, move No, no, I do have, I do have, uh, this is like when there's an audience Q&A and someone stands up and they, they give like a 10 minute long thing and you're like, oh, more of a comment than but a question. because I'm on the panel, maybe I get to do it. <laughs> and no one will roll their eyes at me. Uh, but um, uh, so yeah, this is my long rambling question that I was, uh, so you draw um, in a couple of your recent, mostly I was thinking in Libby's dad and also in, um, in the, um, I fear, I'm, I'm blanking on the towel, but you'll draw a gun. Mm -hmm. And I knew someone once who said that they wouldn't draw a gun. Um, and I thought, I want to be the kind of person who would draw a gun. And I think it's, I think it's because my, um, because my mom who's here is a, a a therapist. And so I always had the thing like, you want to be able to draw the difficult thing. You want mm -hmm. to be able to talk about the hard stuff. Yep. Um, and I, reading your work, I sense you want to talk about the hard stuff. And so you want to, you want to uh, have a language to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I can sense when you're drawing the gun, you're, you're kind of, it's a charged moment, I think, for you. Yep. Um, so then if you want, and I think that all of the work that I like has that where it's, um, I have, part of do, doing the hard stuff is you're risking embarrassment. Mm -hmm. um, so how, what is the inner um, compass? Because if you play it, 
Um, there are so many comics, um, maybe the majority of comics, that I feel like you can be a little too cool for school, and it can be ironic. And but I want to see some. There has to be some something at stake mm -hmm. for me to like it. Even it can be funny, but I want something at stake. Mm -hmm. But then you can be embarrassing or corny. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what's the area that is um, so sincere that it gets into corny for you? Do you have an idea of that line? And then what's the, do you have a line where it's so ironic where you think, why are you wasting my time? Do you have an idea in your mind of this zone? <laughs> this is kind of sadistic laugh a little bit. Um, It'll be your turn next, don't worry. I don't know if I have as, as good of a question as that. Uh, I mean, that's... Have you had thoughts along these lines of... I mean, yes. I'm trying to, to think of what to ad address first. I, I think it's interesting that you brought the gun thing up because um, I've drawn several guns and I've had a number, not a ton, but, you know, I, I, there was a... The gun in Libby's dad. I think I had some sort of show where I wanted to put it in as an example, like is you know one of the artworks in the show, and somebody said that they didn't one of the curators was like, "Oh, that's too upsetting, and it literally is an outline of a gun. it's like a white shape with and then also I think that I did a poster for s b x like eight years ago or so that had a guy holding a gun. And these are works that are, the whole point of them, to some extent, was to be critical of guns. And I was very surprised in both cases that the, that the images had enough power that people didn't even want to look at them. Which is, I mean, I, I'm not like a, I'm an overly sensitive person. Like, I understand like seeing something and having it be upsetting, but I was like, isn't that what we're doing? Aren't we, aren't we trying to like work on these ideas together? Are we just going to hide from them? Um, and then like the cool versus like the, the funny versus, or like too cool for school versus like corny too sincere. <sighs> I, you just can't think about it that much. You, okay. just, you just have to make sure that, you, I, I'm just trying to make something that's as good as I can, and I don't, usually when I write or draw something, I'm thinking about just a couple of I try to just think about a specific people that I'm writing for. Like, would they like it? Um, rather than thinking. You know, what's everybody going to think? It's, I don't know if it's so much how people are going to take it, but uh, like, I had a long conversation with someone about the Angelo Badalamenti, you know, that composer? And I was like, no. does he, he did the score for like David Lynch movies, and they're quite melodramatic. Um, the score for Twin Peaks is the most famous score. You know, it's very swooning. And I was like, does, does he think it's slightly ironic? Mm -hmm. And I bet if you asked him, he would say no. You know, like what? Like, like is the, the cure just 3,000% sincere? Uh, but there's something in the execution where there's enough of a distance on it mm -hmm. where it doesn't feel corny. Although some people, that's what other people would say, that music's corny or that score is corny. But mm -hmm. in, my, in my compass, I'm into it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Whereas, you know, to pick like an easy example, like there's like Disney things <laughs> where you're just like someone is overacting so much mm -hmm. that it goes into corniness. Um, so I tr sometimes I think just the line being dead will cut back on some of, like you could, like let's say you're drawing someone crying, something like that. Gets kind of gross. It is gross. So uh, maybe if the line is a little disinterested, it can get you there a bit more than it feeling like, uh, um, you know, the, I'm picturing like the, the evil guy in Hunchback of Notre Dame um, dancing with the person in the castle, like where it's just so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder. It, 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 speaking. Bunch of, of very specific. <laughs> <laughs> is it? There, speaking of David Lynch in Blue Velvet, uh, there's this. I can't remember any of their names, um, but when the girlfriend realizes that her uh, boyfriend was was cheating on her with the, oh my God, why are we talking Isabella about Isabella Rossellini. This? Isabella Rossellini yeah. character. She, she, she has this look of horror and her whole face like collapses. And then he, he stays on her face for way too long, like longer than he should have. Uh -huh. And it's what makes it interesting. Uh -huh. um, and I think I tried to like, in my, in my book, The Hard Tomorrow, and the end, it, the end is it's just a shot of a baby. And if my intention, I was like, okay, so if it's just a shot of a baby, this book would be so cheesy and it would be horrible. So I'll put in four shots of a baby. Mm -hmm. It'll be too much baby. And then everybody will get it. But then a lot of people were like, this is so cheesy. And I was like, fuck, I should have put in more baby. I should have had like 20, just more, more, more baby. Anyway, so that, that's a big regret. That, um, that's a great answer to the question. <laughs> so so the, it's like that you thought, well, if it goes so far into yeah. the melodrama, it ceases being melodrama. That's kind of what you're saying. In a way, that's kind of like figure drawing you exaggerate something so much it becomes a bit of a caricature. Yeah. So then it turns back into being a little... And the, and the hope is that you, you make the, the audience sit with the feeling for long enough that they get past the first feeling and they go into a second feeling. I, <laughs> I have never seen The Graduate, but I read a review. <laughs> of the graduate that I think about all the time, where <laughs> they get together. Sorry, this is just the exact same thing as the in Blue Velvet. Uh, I guess the couple gets together, and they're driving, and they've gotten on this bus. Right. And it's kind of a happy ending. But then apparently, it also is too long. So like, so like the big thing, he gets the girl, they jump on the bus, they're laughing, they're sitting in the bus, and then it lingers for two minutes as their expressions change and the sense is like, now what? Right, right, yeah, so the hope is that like, the, the, the easy feeling is happy, they're in love, they're together now, and then mm -hmm. if you sit f with it for too long, then it's not, it's not just that it, it's that you are forced to go past the shallow feeling and, and, and grapple with the, the reality that's behind the shallow feeling. And that's a that great of, question. That's a sad sense of intentionality I mentioned earlier that like you're going for this really deliberate effect yeah. over the top. I, I kind of have a similar question for you. So I just read Blurry, which was wonderful. When is, when is it? Is it out already? It's out, yeah. Okay, I really recommend it. Um, Thanks, and, Eleanor. <laughs> well, thank you for, for writing and drawing it. And I almost had, I was so delighted with it. I had just read a really depressing, depressingly bad comic that I'm not going to say what it was. 
<laughs> that's rude. Uh, but it was just so boring. And I was like, oh, what is comics? What are we doing here? What, do I even like comics? Fuck everything. Life is shit. And then I read your comic, and it's so good. And it is so goofy, uh, mixed with serious. And you just are willing... Like, the ending is so... Was the ending supposed to be really goofy? I'm curious. Um, the goofiness, I think I kind of know what you're referring to, but it's a bit of a spoiler. I know, I'm sorry. Well, but, without, uh, without getting specifically into it, I just, and, and with all your work, I feel like you're willing to mix, you're willing to mix being really serious with just kind of fucking around in a way that was, anyways, so when I read your book, it was such a relief to just be like, oh my God, thank God that I got to read a good comic. <laughs> was the other one too serious or too goofy? It, it was too serious and it was boring. And it was, boring. I was like, why did anybody write this? Why did anybody draw this? This is a waste of paper. Uh, sorry, God, I'm being really negative. I don't feel like that about most comics, but like it just didn't, it didn't seem like anybody was having fun with it. Mm -hmm. And you, your stuff seems so fun and so brave because you, you really fuck around? And is that how you feel well, drawing it? I felt like I, to my, I feel like I use the word fun to describe it to other people. I'm glad that it comes that off that way to you. Because to me, blur, the um, blurry, for people who don't know, it, it starts at very, um, someone choosing between two dress shirts, a very small indecision, and it goes further and further in on people on these small indecisions, and then the latter half is it all coming out. And so when it starts, you're like, oh, this is just some automatic writing, some rambling thing, we're following people, and it's then- felt like Robert Altman-esque. There's of. a bunch of people, we're following them, and then a bit before the halfway mark, you're like, oh, I think these people are kind of related to each There's something happening where things are related. But then at the halfway point, ideally it changes. And I say that after the halfway point, it's all fun. Because <laughs> that's how I think of it. Uh -huh. Because now you're seeing all of these things add up mm -hmm. that I had set up before. And particularly the ending, I think of as fun. Mm -hmm. It's maybe not. Um, you know, Disney World for some people, but it, it's a version of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fun, I think, is usually something that's a little satisfying and surprising. Um, and it's a bit um, like a, a bit like the person doesn't quite know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's an element to fun. Um, Whereas, uh, and yeah, it's hard to talk about a specific comic without dissing the comic. But there's everyone, um, and and uh, people have different uh, radars for what's too too boring. I watch movies all, and read things all the time that other people say are totally boring. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'll try to go to see the giant movie in the theater and I'm bored out of my mind. Um, I think uh, fun is just surpri something surprising mm -hmm. and uh, not, being, um, not being, someone's not trying to teach you something, that really turns me off. Mm -hmm. Someone feels like they, if the author knows something. Uh-oh. Yeah, not having it. <laughs> yeah. That's did, interesting. <laughs> did you find doing the book Discipline fun? No. No, didn't seem fun. <laughs> yeah, that one was not fun. Yeah, <laughs> that one wasn't fun. <laughs> it, it was uh, based on like Civil War letters. Yeah, Quaker letters that I come. It was fun when it was fun when you'd find the research was fun mm -hmm. when you'd find something. That was really fun. And it was fun to try to pair it with something that would equal a third thing. Um, but actually, it's kind of a funny thing to talk about, because uh, that book 
has no jokes in it. And I'm sure people would pick up that book and think, of course, it's, so, so, it's such a serious thing you know, to look at this person. Although I do think that technically that book teaches you nothing, which I'm quite proud of. Mm. <laughs> uh, the, um, because it's just pairing these letters with the imagery of what ha it, do I, I don't, it does. I put a list at the end of books that might teach people something if they bought this book hoping to learn something. Because there's so few books about Quakers, I thought, I felt some responsibility to, if I didn't teach anybody anything, at least write down some places where they could learn something if they care. Um, but it was quite hard for me to do a book that had no jokes in it. And I thought, do I put it, uh, you know, personally, mm -hmm. I was like, man, ah, who wants to like do it? So that's what made it hard. But then when I decided it's OK, so few comics have no joke, like I thought it's OK. Just it w I thought it was um, and I, but it took me a long, I quit that book a bunch of times and mm -hmm. thought it was a bad idea and, and thought, you know, it was a whole mind fuck, that I, book. I, I was wondering, it seemed like a very hard book to, to write and draw, but it was, the art is, I wouldn't say the art's fun, but the art's beautiful. The, um, I spent, a, be, that book was kind of made like how some people make documentaries where they just gather footage and then they mm -hmm. edit it together as they go and they don't know what they're doing and then 10 years later they're like, oh, I guess I have a movie that has a beginning, middle, and an end, but when I was making it, it was just a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was the process. So yeah, it was fun, like near, near the, I didn't have an ending for years basically. And then um, near, I found, a, a document that was a Quaker meeting house letting back in someone who had fought. Um, and the text was like, so the person had killed people mm -hmm. and wanted to join the meeting again. And the, the text of the letter said the, that um, if an arm is diseased, it needs the whole body to heal. You don't cut off the arm, mm -hmm. meaning he should be back in the meeting. And what a cool, the, tech, the, the way they wrote was so weird. They still mm -hmm. said the and thou yeah. and all this kind of stuff. When I found that, I was like, that was fun. Yeah. And I still play that in my head. Like if my, if my friend is being a jerk or there's someone I'm, I think, no, the whole, don't cut off the arm. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the body here. Like, let's try to keep it going. Mm -hmm. is, is, that, <laughs> is that book? Reading that book, I was curious. It's not easy comics, like the the in terms of. I feel like you'd have to be very comic literate to be able to read it. Has that been something that have you found non comics people interested in it because of the subject matter, and then not be able to read it in the way that they want or the way that you would want? I'm so crazy. <laughs> I. When I drew that, I thought, this is perfect. You don't even have to be able to read comics to read this thing. <laughs> There's no panels. There's no word balloons. I'm telling the eye where to go at every single thing. And uh, in my defense, New York Review thought the same thing. Okay. They were like, we could, you know, it's, people don't even have to know about a com. Um, but what's funny is, uh, uh, but of other, yeah, other people told me, okay. they said, this one is hard to, <laughs> to um, but have people said any, have people said to you that something's hard that you didn't intend to be hard? Uh, intend to be hard. Well, no, I do, you, no one probably ever intends something to be difficult or alienating. Oh, no, but that's not true. did, uh, yeah, okay, some people, but <laughs> do, uh, did, did a um, reaction, did you ever have anything like that? <laughs> no. I mean, I've had people who haven't, I no. had people who haven't gotten, received the intended, my intention from the comic, which meant that I fucked up somehow. 
that I, you know, I didn't do a good job. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there are people who just don't read comics, and they're confused right. by comics inherently. So, how do you feel about those? Um, how do you feel about those people? I don't give a fuck about them. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> no. I know. My, um, uh, I weirdly, I weirdly get it. Mm -hmm. you Be because I, um, I think that there's something really different about words and pictures, and that putting them together is a little confusing. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, it, I didn't get it. Is it hard for you? It's not hard I, for you to read comics. No, no. Okay. Um, but probably like you, I've always read comics. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but I don't, I, I used to think, I used to not get it, but I do think that there's ve they're very different parts of a brain. And if I, if I did a comic that was like a historic, if I did a comic that was like Disciplined, I think it would bother me more because, I mean, I've never tried to reach an audience that was not a comics, that wasn't nerds, basically. I didn't try to reach those people. I, um, it was more an idea for a book I had, and that's the only way I could have made it. Mm -hmm. um, I know... I thought about it so long, I knew the version that would have worked for people. It would have had the beginning that said, oh, Quaker Oats, you think Quakers are this thing, they're not. I, and uh, I, and I've, I actually saw books come out where I saw, oh, they did this thing that I thought about and I knew would kind of work, but I decided not to do it. Mm -hmm. A big thing was I didn't want to put 20, 15, whenever I was working, I didn't want to put those thoughts into the heads of the people. Mm -hmm. I only wanted to go on what they wrote. Mm -hmm. So just doing that, you're going to confuse a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Because usually historical fiction is about making the people seem like present day people yeah. and entering their heads. So instead I'm using a bunch of letters where they said the and thou and sound like weirdos saying all this weird stuff because it was what they actually wrote. But I thought that was more interesting because I don't know, I honestly don't know what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. I only know what they wrote down. And there would be like a battle and the person just wrote down the weather mm -hmm. or what they ate, you know? Uh, so I didn't, um, um, that one was maybe more of an experiment than other ones. It's a beautiful yeah. book. Both of, I mean, it's and very. Uh, it just felt really good to read. With both blurry and discipline, just read something where it was like, "This is somebody who's doing what he wants to do." Uh, I don't know. I found it very moving. Thanks. Um, with 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 blurry though, was it because <sighs> I feel like it it also is very serious. It has, you know, it has this fun aspect to it. But Do you ever take out jokes from your comic? Yes, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for sure. Um, with, did you, so, so there's a lot of really serious stuff in Blurry and hard stuff and characters having struggles. And did you... And, and it's an interesting, it feels kind of clashy, like the combination of the seriousness and the, the stuff that's more fun or slightly goofy. Was that something that, that was a conscientious choice or that you worried about one kind of clashing with the other? Because I, I loved it, but it also was, it felt noticeable. Hmm. I didn't, I mean, I'll definitely, like you said, I'll definitely um, take out jokes if I feel like it's somehow um, I do yeah it th I think it's maybe what I like I want I there has to be something at stake otherwise I don't care mm -hmm. um, and uh, I like reading something that only borderline is I find it entertaining when it feels like you're not sure if it's for entertainment mm -hmm. um, so I think, but I don't, uh, I don't think, oh, I've been so serious in this moment, so I need a joke or anything like that. 
Um, and you don't worry about the jokes undercutting the seriousness or vice versa? Um, well, in those cases, maybe that would be when I would try to take out a joke or not do something or, but it's a pretty like intuitive, intuitive call. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, even what some people might find serious, other people might not. And of course, humor is pretty, uh, especially when you make cartoons, you can see how, you know, you'll do screenings of cartoons and the whole theater will laugh at something and the next screening mm -hmm. of the same movie, they won't mm -hmm. laugh at all. Mm -hmm. And you'll wonder, it, oh, it was just the temperature in the room or something or maybe one person in the theater let other people know that it was okay to laugh and so it becomes funny or who knows. Indeed. Cool. Um, I'm afraid that is our time. Oh, no. Oops. Um, Thank you both so much. Thank you all thank for coming. Yeah, yeah. thanks thank so much for, for coming. Thank you for talking with us. We're going to, uh, since there wasn't an audience Q&A, you're welcome to oh, ask sorry. us questions. If, what table are you at? Oh, uh, I can't remember, but I'm signing at the Fanographics table uh, at 4, if anybody wants to come by. And if, um, I'm at, oh, table W67 um, at, from 5 to 6. Where are you signing? And I'm, I'm at the New York Review of Comics table. Cool. All right. Thank you thanks all so much everyone. for coming. Thank you, Rob. And thanks to both of thank you. Thank you, Rob.